Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's seventh webinar in this eight-part series called Montana's Native People, Perspectives on the Clovis Child, hosted by the Yellowstone Gateway Museum. My name is Diane Chalfont, and I'm a volunteer and board member of the Yellowstone Gateway Museum here in Livingston, Montana. The Clovis Child refers to the 12,600-year-old Anzic site in Park County, Montana, the oldest burial site in North America. Since it was first discovered in the 1960s, the site and the remains of the child buried there have been the focus of cultural and scientific study. This series is career oriented and it's particularly directed toward college and tribal uh, college and high school students considering careers in the, in the fields related to our speaker's work. We've asked our speakers to talk about their work, their various perspectives on the Clovis child site and their personal journeys in their professions. In a moment, I'll introduce the museum's interim director, Karen Reinhardt. But first, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items so that you'll know how to participate in today's event. At any time during the webinar, you'll have the opportunity to submit your questions to today's presenter, Amanda Trum. Your questions will be anonymous. To submit a question, just type the question in the Q&A tab at the bottom of the control panel, and Karen and I will read the questions and share them with our speaker. As time allows, Amanda will address as many of the questions as she can during a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. We do have many participants today, and we want to be sure that we can track and answer any questions that you may have. So again, please do use that Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. We will be recording this webinar, and we'll upload it to Yellowstone Gateway Museum's YouTube channel after the event. And finally, following the webinar, you'll have the opportunity to take a very short survey. We really would like you to do that. It'll help us improve all programs at the Yellowstone Gateway Museum. Now I'd like to introduce Yellowstone Gateway Museum's interim director, Karen Reinhardt. Karen? Thank you, Diane. We'd also like to thank Humanities Montana for funding the webinar series and Montana Office of Public Instruction for additional support. I really hope that our viewers will register for the remaining webinar program next Tuesday, 1.30 p.m., December 8th, for a summary of Anzic site history with Dr. Stockton White. And now, our speaker introduction. Amanda Streeter Trum is the curator of collections at the Montana Historical Society. She spent several years working on cultural resource management archaeology projects across the country before receiving a master's degree in museum studies from the University of Florida in 2007. Her responsibilities at the MHS include caring for the Anzic site artifacts and helping to interpret them for the public. Please enjoy the presentation. Okay. See if I can get this started. Well, first of all, um, I just want to say thank you very much for having me. Um, I think this is a great topic to discuss, and I'm really excited to be a part of it. So thank you. Um, so I'll I'll also give you a little bit of background information. Um, I grew up in northern New York, and uh, I got a bachelor's degree in anthropology with minors in archaeology and philosophy from the State University of New York at Potsdam. Um, I attended an archaeology field school in Kenya, where I was able to help excavate a 500,000-year-old Holo erectus site. Um, and so that's kind of represented in the, um, in the image to the left there. That's Mount Kilimanjaro in Kenya with a giraffe in the foreground. Um, so I was able to do that through a neighboring school uh, called St. Lawrence University in northern New York. I then uh, spent several years after I graduated doing uh, CRM archaeology. So I know that you guys have heard that term uh, a few times over the past few weeks, but it stands for cultural resource management archaeology. So this kind of archaeology happens when new construction projects um, might destroy archaeological sites. So the area has to um, be tested for any cultural material before, before it's um, destroyed. 
So that's what's happening here in the photo in the upper right. Um, I'm working with two good friends of, friends of mine, uh, June Ebersol and Jennifer Hutchie Palmer. So we were working in Pennsylvania and they were about to widen that road. Um, the county was widening the road and so we had to test the site first to make sure that they wouldn't destroy any cultural sites. So then um, after several years of doing CRM archaeology, I found myself in an overgrown cotton field in Louisiana in June. And I was digging and screening dirt and I decided at that moment that I had had enough of that. So uh, I went back to school and I got my master's degree in museum studies from the University of Florida. Um, and then I started working at the Montana Historical Society in 2007. So that's me at the bottom of the screen um, in one of our in one of our um, storage areas. So I started um, here as the collections manager and then I became the curator of collections in 2014. So I found this definition of a curator on encyclopedia.com and I actually thought it was a really good one. Um, it focuses on acquiring and choosing art and artifacts for exhibit but includes other public outreach like giving tours and um, presenting lectures as well. One thing that I'll say though is that you can see that it says um, acquiring the pieces of art, but that should also say art and artifacts. So. I also wanted to share um, that the curator's job is to interpret or explain the meaning of something, um, which doesn't just mean that we uh, just lay out the facts. We need to provide context um, and share information and stories so that people are able to make a connection between their life and their experiences and the history and stories that are being presented. I also added a line here um, about preservation and access because that's also uh, an important part of the curator's job. So um, there's the dual purpose of preserving artifacts and providing access to information and artifacts themselves. Um, so often those things are at odds with each other um, but of course, we want to make sure that we're accomplishing both of those things. So here are a number of images of um, me and different things that I've done just to kind of give you an idea um, about the different types of things that I do in my job. So one thing that I want to say, though, is that um, different museums have differing ideas about what a curator's job is. So it really depends on the size of the institution and the focus of the museum. So typically in larger museums, the curator's ex expertise is concentrated um, on specific regions or cultures or time periods or types of art. Um, but then curators in smaller museums like mine uh, tend to have to branch out into wider areas of subject matter. So in my job, I need to know a little bit about a lot of things. Uh, and then I need to be able to research and learn about particular subjects in order to um, curate exhibits or write articles about the topic. So um, one thing that I wanted to mention is that I work closely with a lot of other people um, in accomplishing my job. And so um, here I've, I've got a photo of me in storage and then um, the next one over is I'm working with our senior registrar Kendra Newhall and we're um, putting together a mannequin uh, that will go on exhibit. And then in the upper right, there's just um, an image of the first part of the latest exhibit that I've curated here. Um, it's actually currently up right now, and it's called Who Speaks to You? Portraits from the Permanent Collection. And then in the bottom left, um, it's at a, another exhibit opening called Good Beer Here. Um, and so part of my job is to uh, conduct a lot of public speaking or you know, speak at events like that and talk about the subject, talk about the exhibits. And so um, I'm standing there with some colleagues as we, as we open, open the new exhibit. And then in the bottom center, um, this is a really fun part of my job. Every year we have archeology span day. And so students from um, different schools come and participate in different activities. And here um, we're uh, teaching them how to throw an at ladle. So that's always fun. And then the bottom right is me working with our exhibit designer, Roberta Jones Wallace. And so um, we're choosing artifacts there for an exhibit on um, the cartoonist fan lines. So um, I work with you know, some of those people and that also includes uh, editors from our outreach and interpretation program and our publications department. Um, so often I 
I need to learn about the work of others, uh, like some of the professionals that you've heard from so far, Jessica Bush, Eska Willerslev, Sarah Antic, and Saki White, who will present next week. Um, and so I need to learn about what they are doing and place the information that I learn into context with other information that we have um, about any given subject and then distill it for the public and present it in what's hopefully an interesting and digestible package, uh, like an exhibit or a blog post or a lecture um, or an article. So in this way, exhibits and those types of things are kind of like uh, cliff notes for history. So another thing that I wanted to mention is that um, I also supervise three museum program staff, and so there's an element of people management in my position as well. So I thought, um, you know, what I would do is kind of walk you through uh, the exhibit that we have the ANZIC site tools um, interpreted in. And so here's the start of what we call the end of the last Ice Age exhibit. Um, and it's uh, at the beginning of our Montana Homeland Gallery. And so this is where we interpret the ANZIC site. So you can see, um, maybe see in the background there, uh, there's a red orange case, um, and that's where the ANZIC site tools and the information about it are displayed. So this is just kind of how, we, um, how the interpretation of the site is situated in the gallery. So we've tried to um, present the ANZIC site in the broader context of North America and the region. So I thought I'd just show you a few slides, kind of like walking through the exhibit um, so you can kind of get a feel for what it's like. Um, we begin the discussion with uh, the likely routes that people took to get to the Americas. Um, through Beringia is the widely accepted likely route at this point, um, which includes not just walking over um, the Bering Land Bridge, um, but also using watercraft to travel um, along the edge of the continent. So I'd also like to point out that we made a conscious decision to be conservative with the dates. Um, so although there has been some indication that humans arrived in the Americas well before 13,000 years ago, um, we use that date as a rough starting point. Um, and that's because there's a consensus among most scientists that um, people were here at that time. Um, there is not at this point a general consensus um, on the much earlier dates that have been um, posited. Uh, but with more research being conducted um, and more sites being discovered, I think we'll, we'll get there eventually. And I'll point out too that in the text we do talk about um, the fact that, for example, um, the, the Bering Land Bridge had been exposed and covered up by the seas several times um, over the past 40,000 years. And so uh, we recognize that um, people could have crossed over back and forth at any point during that time. We actually know um, we have DNA and fossil evidence um, that shows that animals were doing that same thing. And so it's you know, likely that humans were as well. You can see at the bottom of um, the photo there, uh, there's a screen with Mr. Tony Incasola. He is the director of the Salish Pondere Culture Committee. And we uh, asked him to record a video uh, welcoming visitors to the exhibit. And so he did that with the help of the Salish Kootenai College Media Center. We also incorporated a lot of interactive and hands-on elements, um, which just makes the experience more interesting and uh, sometimes helps to relay the information better. So one example is on the right-hand side, um, you know, it's one thing to say in a text panel that um, mammoths were typically at least 12 feet tall, but it's an entirely different thing to actually stand next to a cutout of a mammoth that's 12 feet tall. So, um, you know, we made an effort to give visitors the opportunity to feel immersed in the time period. So here you can see um, we've got lots more hands-on elements. So um, people are able to touch the skulls that are on uh, the table there in the upper left. Um, we also have molars and we uh, had reproductions made of some of the ANZIC site tools. And so people are able to touch the reproductions as well. You can kind of see in the background there, there's a life-size um, body outline of a scimitar cat. And then just to the right of that, and then you can see in, in the photo at the bottom, there's a life-size scimitar cat head. So people can touch that as well. It's just another way, you know, to, to kind of get a feel for what it was actually like to live there at that time. 
Um, and then, of course, we have um, real Ice Age animal bones um, on display. We're thankful to the Beaverhead County Museum in Dillon and the University of Montana. They've loaned us um, parts of their collections for this purpose. And so you may have noticed in the background of some of the exhibit photos that we have several murals that are on the walls. And so this is another way we've tried to allow people to feel immersed in the time period. Um, we commissioned four digital artworks that we then had printed and, and placed on the wall. Um, so this first one is a rendering of what it may have looked like on the Bering Land Bridge 15,000 years ago. Um, so it's showing one possible method of human travel, which is the watercraft in the center, and then some of the animals that lived on the land at that time. And then um, this scene is uh, it's the largest mural that we have in the exhibit. I think it's like six feet high by 10 feet wide. So we really wanted, you know, we really wanted it to pop out and see if, you know, the animals, we could make them kind of as big as possible in that context. Um, so this is a scene that was based on the mural site in the Centennial Valley in Montana. And it shows what it may have looked like about 13,000 years ago when um, the Anzic child and his family lived here. So you can see, maybe you can see, you might have to find them, search for them. Um, we have three people positioned in the background there. And so we really wanted to remind visitors that people lived in this hostile environment and they lived with these animals and they had to figure out how to survive. So um, we also needed to be careful though, because um, we, we needed to be careful about how we portrayed the people because we don't actually know um, what they looked like or what they wore. Um, but it was still important to include them here. Um, so you get an idea for what it might have been like to, to live during this time. And then we have um, this mural that depicts Glacial Lake Great Falls. Um, we know that Glacial Lake Great Falls um, existed in central Montana um, about 15,000 years ago to about 11,000 years ago. Um, but it was believed to have um, overtopped its banks about 13,000 years ago. Actually, I guess there, there was an ice dam um, that was keeping it all as a lake and the ice dam failed and it released, um, I don't even know how many uh, tons of water um, and it would have created a catastrophic flood for any of the people or animals that were in its way. So. We don't know exactly when that happened. We do know that um, uh, the Anzic child and his family were here 12,600 years ago. Um, so they uh, may have come after or they may have um, been witness to it in some way or his ancestors. So I wanted to point this out too. Um, Oh, actually, you know what, I'm going to go back because one of the things that I wanted to talk about was um, are the camels that are in the image. So I don't know if you noticed them on the, um, the Beringia slide as well. So it's just kind of interesting maybe to think of camels um, living in North America. But the reality is that they actually are native to North America and then they migrated out of the continent. So, um, of course, they died out here in North America, but they ended up thriving in other parts of the world. And then onto this slide, um, I wanted to point this out because this is another um, exhibit or image from the exhibit um, where we have one of the Anzic site tools and it was found to have camel protein along two of its edges. And so you can kind of see my hand is there for um, reference, but uh, there are, you can see the, the red line on the text panel and that's actually where they found the camel protein on the tool. So, Thanks to Stocky White's work, um, we know that the Anzic, the Anzic Child's family likely hunted camels and that at least some of the tools were buried um, with the child were actually used in daily life before they were buried with him. Um, we also know that some of the other tools at the site were found to have rabbit protein on them. And then this is the final mural. Um, it's based on a depiction of another site in Montana, the Black Bear Coulee site. Um, at about 7,500 years ago. So you can see how some of the animals have changed. There are no more megafauna, so no more 
um, mammoths or giant short-faced bears, um, but we still see bison, horses, and now the presence of elk, um, as well as coyotes and rabbits. And then you can see um, in the background there, we're also indicating um, that there are prototypes of teepees. So once again, you know, we wanted to be careful, but we also wanted to, because we don't actually know, um, you know, we're, we're um, you know, we think that this is the type of dwelling that people at that time um, used in this region. And so we wanted to make sure that it was depicted there, but you know, we're, we don't have all of the details. So these are some of the techniques that we use to bring the Anzic child story to life. So here I wanted to talk about several things. Um, the first, I know that you guys have seen uh, this array of Anzic tools um, over the presentations, but this is how they appear now in the exhibit. Um, I wanted to point out that they're they're actually on loan to us from three different families. So the Historical Society does not own them. They're on loan to us um, from Mel and Helen and Sarah Anzic, of course. Um, and then also the other two are the construction workers who discovered the site, Calvin Sarver and his family, and Ben Hargis and his family. So uh, the backdrop you can see um, was painted uh, with red ochre. And that came from a sacred Salish location in Montana. It was provided to us by a Salish board member for this purpose. Um, so the, when, when the child and the tools were buried, they were first covered in red ochre. And that's how they were discovered as well. Um, but the people who found the tools, found the site, just had no idea what the significance was. And so they ended up washing off the ochre. Um, but you can see in some of the, the elk antler tools at the bottom of the case there and the, um, the light color tools on the left hand side, you can still see um, the staining from, from the ochre. And what's incredible is that it's almost an exact match um, to the color of the, the ochre that, that was gathered recently. Um, so I also wanted to mention a couple of other things. Um, the, the remains of the 18-month-old boy have never been on exhibit, um, neither here um, at the Montana Historical Society nor anywhere else, which I think is important for everyone to remember. And I guess I just wanted to say too that, you know, there are important things that we can learn from studying sites like these, and it's not just about having an understanding of our collective human history, um, but it's also learning things like how we might improve health and medicine for um, indigenous communities. So a couple of the other photos there, um, at the bottom left there is Mr. Inkashola, and he is speaking at the exhibit's opening reception. And then on the right hand side, there are high school students dancing in their jingle dresses, and they started a round dance with um, some of the kids who were at the opening. And then it's really hard to see, but in the background, um, there are the, uh, they're dancing to the magpie drummers and singers who are who are there as well. So um, I wanted to mention too that there's a new movement in the museum field, or at least a relatively new movement, and that is that there's a broad effort now to um, decolonize museums, uh, which basically means that there's an effort to counteract or correct the hundreds of years of only white people writing history and only telling that side of the story. And so um, there are lots of different ways that we um, can go about doing that. And um, one of them is to hire indigenous staff members who bring different perspectives um, to any topic that you might be talking about um, in the museum. Uh, we also work with uh, tribal consultants and advisory councils on projects that involve tribal topics. So you may have heard the phrase, nothing about us without us, and that's exactly what this um, means. So it's to help ensure that exhibits and programs are accurate and incorporate tribal viewpoints. Institutions also need to recognize the history of scientific racism and understand that it has led to some of the problems of exclusivity that we see in many institutions. And we need to understand that there has also been a history 
of the belief that um, Western scientific knowledge is the only way to know things, as opposed to acceptance and respect um, for all of the different indigenous ways of knowing and understanding history and culture. So, of course, these movements um, will be an ongoing process with successes and failures along the way. Um, it won't happen overnight and it won't happen without stumbles and mistakes being made. Um, but the point is that we're trying to move forward together um, and we should continue having these conversations um, because it's the only way that we'll make progress. So my last slide are just um, it's a list of some resources that you might want to check out. So you can look at these websites to kind of get a feel for the topics that are being discussed in museums. And um, many of them uh, list, list uh, current job postings. Um, definitely AAM and AFLH do that. Um, and then uh, occasionally the Museums Associ Association of Montana will do that. And then if um, MHS has a job opening we also post it as well. So um, even if you're not looking to apply for a job, um, you can still you can still see the different types of jobs that are out there and also what requirements museums have for any given position. So you know you can kind of learn about the expectations for the job and, and you know the, the types of education that they would expect you to have if you were going to apply. And then um, another great way to get a feel for museum work, of course, is to volunteer. So um, you might be able to try out different jobs that way in the museum. Um, but at the very least, you can always talk to staff about, um, about their work and what they do. So if you're looking to get a job in a museum, um, it's a great way to show that you're interested and that you're serious um, about the work. And then I have um, my contact information there, so feel free to call or email anytime, and I'm happy to um, answer any questions or continue the conversation. Well, thank you so much, Amanda. Thanks for taking us on, a, on, a, on your career path journey, and also for taking us on a tour of the ANZIC site um, exhibit at the museum. Um, and we do actually have a question that came up um, regarding um, something you mentioned um, about the objects on exhibit. And the question is about the camel and rabbit protein that was found on the tools. How do you detect that? How is that? That's a great question. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, I'm sorry to say that I don't know the answer exactly, um, but I know who does know the answer, and that would be Stocky White. Um, so he's presenting next week, and he would definitely be able to get into the details about how that happened. Um, so I believe it was some kind of DNA testing, but that's about all I know. Okay, we'll, we'll relay that question uh, to Stocky uh, so that we can provide an answer next week. Um, I also really appreciated your um, talking about the museum trends coming up because when you talk about trends regarding decolonizing museums and um, the idea of nothing about us without us and talking about the history of scientific racism, all these things really kind of get to the core of what we were hoping to accomplish with this series, and that is to encourage um, tribal students to really consider careers in all of these fields, the, the uh, museum fields, the cultural fields, and the scientific fields. So um, we really appreciate you kind of bringing it all together um, at, at the end of your presentation, really, really helpful. And we're going to open it up for more questions. If there are any more, please go ahead and type them in the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. And in the yeah, and I'll, I'll take... Sorry, go ahead, Karen. Oh, well, why don't you go ahead and then I will ask a question that I have in my mind. Okay, sure. No, I was just going to say that um, I know that in Jessica Bush's talk, she also um, talked about similar things and she had mentioned, um, you know, that it would be great to have more um, indigenous students um, in the field of archaeology. And so, you know, I feel the same way about um, the museum field. But the other thing to note is that, you know, there are lots of different ways to get into the museum field. And, you know, I know that um, 
discussion about cultural resource management to archaeology has come up several times. And, and you know, I just wanted to say that that happens to be part of my background, um, but that is by no means the way that you would need to get um, to museum work. Um, it's just one path of many um, that you can take. And of course, there are tons of different subjects that you can um, learn about and be interested in. And so, you know, there are lots of there are lots of different topics that you can immerse yourself in when you're um, thinking about a career in the museum field. So it doesn't just have to be about, you know, indigenous topics. It can be about anything. Does, does Montana Historical Society have um, interns or do you bring on students during the, the course yeah, of their work? Do. Yeah, that's a good question. We do occasionally have interns. Um, they typically come from Carroll College, which is um, a college in Helena. Um, but yeah, we're always excited to have interns and people who are interested in the field and, um, you know, who want to who wanna help out, so that's okay. great. Yeah, just a little side note, the Yellowstone Gateway Museum of Park County in Livingston also has a summer intern program. Um, sometimes it's uh, every year, occasionally it's every other year, but it, it does provide a really rich experience for people who are studying history or museum studies. And right now we just have a working relationship with Montana State University for those interns. And um, actually, Karen, I, that reminds me, I, wanted, I was wondering whether um, MSU still has a museum studies minor. Do you know if that's still the case? Yes, I believe that they do. Yep. Great. So Amanda, I just had a couple of, uh, little questions, um, maybe they're big, I don't know, but um, I wondered, um, looking at the full scope of your work and all the varied things that you do, what would be the most rewarding thing that you've done and also the most challenging? Hmm. Well, um, how to answer that question? Well, I guess, you know, like in, in my um, archeology span work, um, that was a lot of fun, but it was also challenging in that, you know, after doing it for several years, it's, you know, it can be hard manual labor. And um, so physically, that was hard work. Um, we also spent a lot of time, um, obviously, you know, working outside and we worked in all different kinds of weather. And so um, that was fun and exciting because I traveled around um, the country, you know, on different projects. Um, but it was also tough work and it was fun for, you know, a few years and then not so much anymore. And then I guess now, you know, I would say that I just have a lot of fun um, doing exactly what I talked about, like learning about different subjects and trying to present that information along with artifacts and images um, in a way that um, is really interesting for our visitors. Um, you know, a, a great way for them to learn about different topics. And so, um, yeah, I know, I, I love doing that kind of thing. Great, thank you. Any other questions that anyone might have of Amanda? I guess not at this point. Um, so I just want to thank you very, very much, Amanda, for your presentation. You. I enjoyed it very much, um, and I'm sure our viewers did as well. Our final webinar in this series is next Tuesday, December 8th, 1.30 p.m. Please join us for a summary of Anzic Site History with Dr. Stockton White. Each webinar is uploaded to the Yellowstone Gateway Museum's YouTube channel following the event. Please consider subscribing so you don't miss any of our programs. We sure hope to see you next week. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you. Bye for now, everyone. Bye.